Welcome to the Workings of Karma lecture series. This is based on the book by the same name. The program structure is as follows. First, we start off with meditation. This is followed by the lecture. We have a questions and answers session scheduled after the lecture. After the questions and answers session, we conclude the program. For the questions and answers session, please post your questions in the Facebook and YouTube chat or comment section in the live video. This program continues on every Wednesday at the same time, that is, 2 p.m. Coordinated Universal Time or Greenwich Mean Time. This translates to 7.30 p.m. Sri Lanka and India time. Please note and convert this time to your local time and join us every week for this enlightening Dharma talk series by a very erudite monk. Today's lecturer has a bachelor's degree in Buddhist philosophy and religious studies from the Buddhist and Pali University of Sri Lanka. Also the Venerable has studied under guidance of notable teachers for five years. Now we invite the most venerable teacher to start the meditation session followed by the Dharma talk and questions and answers session. The meditation session will start now. This will be followed by the lecture. Okay. So we can sit in a comfortable comfortable meditation posture. We will take let's take ten minutes of meditation today. When you sit in a meditation posture, make sure your back is erect. We will meditate with opened eyes. We want to keep our eyes open during meditation so that we don't see nonsense during meditation. And if we are supposed to fall asleep, then at least we notice it because our eyelids are closing. If you keep your eyes closed and meditate, well, then you will not know that you are going to fall asleep because you just fall asleep. If you keep your eyes open, your eyes first have to close so that you can fall asleep. And so you can notice that you're going to fall asleep through the closing of your eyes. So keeping your eyes open during meditation has many advantages and we want to make use of them. But we do not look here and there. We are restrained and we have power over the mind. And if you don't, well, then we need to practice more. So we keep our eyes nicely open and we see the floor in front of us. We do not concentrate on what's on the floor, but sometimes you will obviously notice what is there. We keep our back erect. Our head is a little tilted down and sent a little back. And we see the floor in front of us. And we make the first determination in our minds voicelessly. From now on, for 10 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. From now on, for 10 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. From now on, for 10 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. And with that determination, we can gently lovingly notice there's a flat piece of sinew at the top of the head. We allow it to be heavy and changing. Heaviness here is the element of earth. And changing means is the characteristics of impermanence. And we continue accepting heaviness and change in the other muscles and sinews of the body, to the forehead, eyes, nose, 
lips, chin, cheeks, ears, back of the head. We allow all of the muscles and sinews throughout the head to be heavy. And changing. We continue to the neck. Shoulders, arms, elbows, forearms, wrists, palms. Fingers, chest, abdomen, back, We allow all of the muscles and sinews throughout the upper part of the body to be heavy and changing. We continue to the buttocks, thighs, knees, arms, heels. Toes, toes, tips of toes. We allow all of the muscles and sinews throughout the body to be happy. and changing. And as we allow the body to be the way it is, as we give the body freedom to be the way it is, we ourselves achieve freedom and peace. So let's observe this freedom. Let's enjoy this peace.
When we have established peace in the mind, we can share it with other living beings. We can start in our room. We don't force, we don't expect, just allow. May all beings in this room be in peace. May all beings in this building be in peace. May all beings in this city or village be in peace. May all beings in this country be in peace. May all beings on this planet be in peace. May all beings, including me, be in peace. Now, because the time for the sitting is finished, let's make the last determination in our minds voicelessly. From now on, I will always be calm. From now on, 
I will always be calm. From now on, I will always be calm. And with that determination, we can slowly, mindfully change the way of our sitting. And when we have changed the way of our sitting, let's take one more minute during which we will enjoy the peace we gained in meditation. Very well, so we can move on to discussing Kamma, the law of Kamma based on the book The Workings of Kamma by Pao Xiado. So we'll start now. A questions and answers session will be held after the lecture. Post your questions in the Facebook and YouTube chat or comments section. So, yesterday we were talking about Kamma in the conventional sense. We were talking more about how the world works, how the world looks like, and the problems with that. Today we are going back to a rather, um, rather philosophical and experiential um, explanations related to Kamma. So the Buddha is now going to explain um, what is it like to be somebody who's not enlightened. Suppose then because a dog was clog bound and to a strong post or pillar was bound close. It would keep going round and circling round that same post or pillar. So clock bound, we already uh, explained, is when the dog has a piece of wood hanging from its neck and um, uh, hanging from its neck on probably a short, short rope. Uh, and that piece of um, wood uh, is right in front of the knees of the dog. And when the dog runs, this piece of, uh, a piece of wood, uh, due to its bumping into the knees, and then bumping out and then into the knees and then out as the dog is running, um, this stick is uh, causing a lot of pain to the dog. And so the dog simply doesn't run. So the dog walks, walks slowly. And um, now suppose that the dog is at the same time also bound by a rope to a strong post, to a pillar or column. So in that case, uh, the dog would be going round and round and round without running. And those who are not enlightened are supposed to be just like that. All right, so the image of the clockbound dog the Buddha uses as a simile to describe what he calls the uneducated ordinary person. Asutava putujjano, putujjano. Here, asutava, a, not sutava, somebody who has heard a lot. Putu, 
Jano. Uh, Putu Jano is a person who uh, is bound to birth, old age, illness, and death. So it's an uneducated person who is going to be born in other existences. Someone who is uneducated in and ignorant of both the theory and practice of the Dhamma, someone who possesses neither learning nor attainment. So what shall we do with them? Shall we throw them away or cause them troubles? Not at all. Instead, they need to be educated about the Four Noble Truths. So the difference between the aggregates, Kanda, the elements, Dhatu, and the sense basis, Ayatana, which are the first Noble Truth. So these are the requirements for a streamenter. For a second, for a once returner, it is dependent origination. So the uh, so uh, the enlightened people uh, are also very clear about dependent origination. Then an arahant ideally would have all would have mastered all of the four foundations of mindfulness. So the arahant is skillful in meditating on the body, feelings, mind, and phenomena. And Then the, the uneducated person has not practiced systematically and so has not discerned any of these things either and so has attained no uh, enlightenment. And uh, so this ordinary person is somebody who is one of the many, Putu, who are without morality, Sila, who are averse, so disappointed with the Dhamma, Arya Dhamma. So Arya Dhamma here is the word for noble Dhamma, not for the person, and who lives according to an inferior Dhamma, Nija Dhamma. So uh, these people, they are supposed to overcome some difficult situations and then in the end go to the forest and there meet the monk uh, and then meet the monk with uh, one single... S okay, so... Um, I've lost it. So uh, this ordinary person is one of many. They do not have morality. And also, they, um, they are not happy about Dhamma. And also, they follow inferior Dhamma. That means inferior practice. What is it? So, the ordinary person generates a lot of defilements, such as greed, hatred, delusion. They have a lot of view about self, about permanence, permanent substance. And they also look up to many teachers. Uh, who are not actually uh, following the Dhamma. A very interesting point here with looking up to many teachers in Sutta Nipata commentary, where we get to see this a lot, uh, we learn that one of uh, additional problems is that these uh, ordinary unenlightened people, they change teacher to teacher. So, um, inferior Dhamma are also values that are based on wrong view, contrary to the Buddha's teachings. An ordinary person, furthermore, accomplishes many Kama formations. In other words, they do actions that are based on ignorance. So, because the person who is not enlightened has ignorance, they have not understood the Four Noble Truths, whatever they do, whatever they do, is therefore based on ignorance. So they have ignorance, therefore whatever they do is dependent on the ignorance. And we call these actions or these intentions that are based on ignorance as volitional formations or gamma formations. Volitional just means intentional. Uh, formations means that they do it, that they make it. 
So they make intentions. Their intentions lead to things. Their intentions lead to some events, such as moving their hand, leg, moving their mouth and tongue and saying sounds and things like that. So these are volitional formations in brief intentions. So the ordinary person makes many intentions based on their ignorance. The ordinary person may be reborn in various destinations, so they may be born in the worlds of suffering and also of pleasure based on the actions that they do. Uh, they are also attached to many pleasures through the five sensual, uh, five uh, sensual. Uh, how do we call it? Yes. Uh, so five, five. Well, we could say the five kinds of sensual pleasure. So. Uh, so seeing. Here, All right, seems like I have fell off. I fell off. Not sure how. Oh, again, because of connection. Actually, my connection is very, very fast. So uh, this definitely makes me concerned because this is the second time or second session when we have this problem. So let's see what we can do. So for the time being, uh, probably just reconnecting works. Anyway, so the point here is that uh, an ordinary person is different from an enlightened person. And they are different not only by the fact that they did not go through the attainment, but also through their uh, sila samadhi panya, through their ethics, through their concentration and wisdom. So an enlightened person uh, is always, in a certain way, better in morality, concentration, wisdom. Now, what if the ordinary person gets a jhana, like the highest level of concentration, but the enlightened person is the one who did not attain any jhana? So could we then say that the enlightened person who has no jhana actually has better concentration than the non-enlightened person who has jhana? Yes we can say that not enlightened persons, jhana doesn't make the ordinary person better than uh, an enlightened person who has no jhana. How is that possible? Because the ordinary person will lose their jhana as soon as they engage in some bad deeds or uh, if they simply do not practice. Whereas an enlightened person, an enlightened person does not lose their jhana. An enlightened person, by the enlightenment alone, they have their fixed jhana. So uh, we consider the first level, second level, third level, and fourth level as actually levels of jhana. And these special levels of jhana are not related to concentration on a simple object, but they're related uh, to the clear comprehension and understanding of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self. The uneducated ordinary persons, person is not seeing noble ones. I see. The uneducated ordinary persons not seeing noble ones is of two types. Not seeing with the eye and not seeing with knowledge. For even though one may see noble ones with one's physical eye, one sees only their exterior, not their noble state. There are kinds of people, very evil people, who simply because they're evil, they cannot see the Buddha. 
they will not be able to come up and see the Buddha or visit the Buddha. So that's the first time, but uh, that's the first type. But here, what we are more interested in is uh, not seeing them by knowledge. So, is it possible for is it possible for an enlightened person to recognize another pre people's enlightenment? Traditionally, that's believed so, but it is totally wrong. It is totally wrong. You can, uh, it seems you can uh, recognize another person's enlightenment if you have psychic power of telepathy, of, uh, you know, uh, understanding what another person thinks about without them telling you. But we don't have it or I don't have it. And because we do not have this uh, telepathic ability, not be able, or that's how I... Okay, are we back? So, uh, the Buddha uh, admonished the Venerable Vakali because looking at the Buddha's appearance, which is changing and impermanent, unsatisfactory in itself, doesn't really make much, make much sense. It is better if Vakali considers the Buddha's teachings of Dhamma, that is, for example, the five aggregates of the body, feelings, perceptions, intentions, consciousness, and thereby attains Dhamma, and thus he will understand the Buddha. And it seems that understanding what the Buddha means by Four Noble Truths, through our own very deep, very powerful meditation practice, it seems that uh, this is... that definitely is, is the main point. So Vakali could see the Buddha through his experience. This is also one of the verses used by Mahayana to prove that there are these three kinds of body. That is Sambhogakaya, Dhammakaya, and then uh, uh, there is one, one more. So, um, no, we do not really accept that the Buddha would have three bodies in once. They're totally not in accordance with Theravada scriptures. But still, it is possible to understand what the Buddha means through one's own understanding. So, Kamma forms, uh, uh, Kamma forms based on physical, verbal, and mental actions. Two types of I are described in, for example, uh, Dhamma Sangani, uh, in, yes. And mm, there is this chapter, Discussion of the Classification of Derived Materiality. I searched it and truly, truly it's there. The, uh, the heading is not exactly like this, but it's pretty close. Dhamma Sangani commentary and Majjhimanikaya commentary uh, refer to this incident from Vakali Sutta. So as you can see, Vakali Sutta is not only well known by Majjhimanikaya reciters, but also by Dikhanikaya reciters, and that's a, a pretty large amount of monks. For by the Dhamma seeing Vakali, one me sees, me seeing one Dhamma sees. In other words, understanding the impermanence and satisfactoriness not self in all beings one understands why is the buddha so strict in following the eight precepts yeah, no the eightfold the uh, 
uh, following yeah well following the eightfold noble path so one needs also to see the noble one the noble state of the noble ones and the things pertaining to their noble state so one needs to have known and seen the impermanence anicca suffering dukkha and not self anatta of ultimate materiality and ultimate mentality through inside meditation practice and one needs to have attained to this uh, dhamma that the noble ones have attained so this is written by paoxero this is not in the Pali scriptures and paoxero uh, believes that it's necessary to see the four elements in the body in order that somebody can continue by vipassana but paoxero uh, such as that we first meditate on uh, breath, we then gain some little bit of psychic powers, and then through the psychic powers, we may be able to see the separate uh, groupings or kalapas inside the body, which contain, which is all about matter. Okay, so I think this was more than enough. A lot, a lot of information. So. Let me know if you have any question or if there is anything you would like to know. Now is the best time to, uh, to discuss that. So for the time being, I don't see any comment. You would be writing it right into the comments uh, to the Facebook post or in YouTube. You don't have to come here and do anything at all. Certainly enough, if you just uh, open your device or wherever you have written that, uh, that, for example, you will start your meditation at one, you will end your meditation at two, and then at two, you can go and you can start cooking food and cleaning and things, regardless what do you believe is the most worthy thing to do now. So uh, let me know if anybody has any question, anything you'd like to know, now is the best time to ask. Questions and answers session will start now. Post your questions in the Facebook and YouTube chat or comments section. All right, so it seems that we're not having any questions for the time being. I see. Are there many shades of ordinary people? Yes, there are. There are. Very good question. Very good question. Yes, there is Kalyana Putujjana and then there is Bala Putujjana. Kalyana Putujjana, so not really many, right? But we could say that there are many and I will explain, but Mostly in our scriptures, you will get these two, Kalyana Putujjana and Bala Putujjana. Kalyana Putujjana is a good, ordinary person. Bala Putujjana is a foolish, ordinary person. Here you need to understand that in Pali texts, Kalyana means not just good, but it means amazing, marvelous, excellent, inspirational, very wise, very good practicing well, doing everything right. That is the meaning of the word Kalyana, not just the mediocre good, not at all. Then we have Bala Putujjana. And what we were talking about today was Bala Putujjana. So we described very in uh, a minute detail the, uh, the inabilities of Bala Putujjana. So uh, Bala Putujjana, most importantly, has greed, hatred, ignorance. Bala Putujjana um, uh, does not really follow the Buddha's instruction, does not really meditate well, does not even know how meditation looks like. And Bala Putujjana doesn't have to be away, uh, doesn't have uh, faith in uh, the Buddha, uh, Dhamma, and Sangha. So, um, these are the shades. So Kalyana Putujjana is somebody who knows, who understands, who practices very ardently and follows Sila Samadhi Panya, 
Bala Putujana is someone, somebody who doesn't do, do that. But obviously between them there will be many cases of a person who, uh, who is generous when they see the Buddha only and otherwise they're not generous. Or with um, a lot of extramarital, uh, extramarital pregnancies we get. So uh, we will get uh, cases of people uh, who um, uh, committed sexual misconduct and then they have to suffer uh, then they have to suffer being alone uh, or taking care of the child in an, in an inappropriate uh, residence or in inappropriate conditions. But of course we can further uh, divide uh, put, uh, the putujanas and we could say that um, evil putujanas are simply evil, that's it. But uh, those good putujanas could be further divided into uh, based uh, into um, the kinds based on their uh, based on their meditation practice, based on their level of morality, and so on. So these would be different kinds of putujanas. What is the difference between foolish, uneducated, unwise, untrained, etc.? Actually, here they're the same thing. All right. So, if they're foolish, they're foolish because they don't care. They do not engage in generosity. They do not try to follow virtue, and they do not understand any value in that. Okay. So, because they do not understand the value in sila samadhi panya, which means virtue, meditation, wisdom, they do not see any uh, virtue in learning how to be virtuous. Well, then they are foolish, and they are uneducated because they did not understand, they did not learn that sila samadhi panya are good and need to be practiced. They are unwise because they do not understand the consequences of their actions when they do not engage in good deeds and moreover as many do, uh, as many do when they engage in the unskillful deeds untrained untrained means that they are, were not enough patient to become monks or maybe as lay person maybe as lay pe people they were not enough uh, trained to work with the with their mind to apply uh, to apply mindfulness to the body and to the mind so that they can understand how the nature works. What is the difference between Putujjana and Puggala? Yes, Putujjana uh, is a very specific kind of person. It's a person who is not enlightened. Puggala is any human being in this world. So we have uh, we have Arya Puggala, which are noble people, and then we have Putujjanas. So Puggala in Pali language just means a person. It does not really indicate anything about the person, except that they are a person. But, uh, but um, we... Uh, we talk about Putujana always when the person does not have any enlightenment. If, uh, if they have the first or higher level of enlightenment, they are known as they are known as Seika and then Aseika. So the one who is once returner, the one who strives hard to get second, uh, uh, yes. Uh, to become a uh, uh, yes, so somebody who is a stream mentor, somebody who's a stream mentor is no more a putujana, but they're still pukkala, they're arya pukkala, noble person. And then uh, a once returner, non returner, and arahants, they are also noble persons. All four are noble persons. Anyone else is understood as outside of the lineage. 
okay, outside of the lineage. So inside of the lineage, that is, inside of the lineage, those are the enlightened uh, eight pairs. So path, fruition, path, fruition, path, fruition, path, fruition. But outside, it's a little difficult. So as soon as the environment is closed up or there are some hindrances, well, then it is pretty difficult to get connection with people who are not related. So uh, Putujana is somebody not enlightened. Pugala is uh, either enlightened or not enlightened. Depends on the context. All right, so it was a pleasure to, uh, to share with you my knowledge, my understanding. I'm very happy about these classes because we all learn a lot of new things, I believe. And I hope to see you next week. May you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you be successful in everything you do. concludes today's lecture on the workings of karma. This series is held every Wednesday at the same time, that is, 2 p.m. Coordinated Universal Time or Greenwich Mean Time. This translates to 7.30 p.m. Sri Lanka and India Time. Please note your local time and join us every week. Let us take a moment to share merits with everyone now. Stay tuned for more content like the workings of karma. We are working hard to bring practical insights from Buddhism to improve your lives and the world at large. To get notified about new releases and also to help us spread the word, if you haven't already done so, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and turning on notifications. Also please consider watching some of our other content. We also have content in other languages too. Also, please consider subscribing to our other language channels. Hoping to see you again in our live programs.